Good morning, everybody. Welcome for this uh, new colloquium in this uh, Severo Ochoa program. Today, we will have uh, the talk by Dr. Bruce Elmer Green, and he will talk about the regularly spaced eight micron cores as tracers of the earliest stage of star formation in spiral arms of nearby galaxies. Um, the presentation of uh, Dr. Elmer Green will be done by uh, Dr. Isabel Marquez, who is the scientific director of the program. Isabel, please. Hello, thank you, Rene. Uh, hello, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here again to attend another uh, Severo Ochoa colloquium. First of all, thank you very much, uh, uh, Bruce Elmer Green, for being here, for having accepted our in invitation that I'd like to, first of all, uh, extend to, uh, to an in-person one in the future when, when possible. We'll be really honored and glad to, to have you here in, in the next future, I hope. Um, Bruce Elmer Green is in the research division of IBM, currently co-leading the materials discovery program in the Future of Climate Initiative. Uh, Dr. Elmer Green was raised in Milwaukee and attended the University of Wisconsin in Madison as an undergraduate. He received a PhD uh, in astrophysics at Princeton University and was a junior fellow at Harvard University. He was chair of the publications board of the American Astronomical Society um, and is currently a member of the publications board of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. In 2001, he received the uh, Danny Heinemann Prize of the uh, Astronomical, uh, American Astronomical Society and the American Physical Society. And in 2016, an IBM Research Outstanding Accomplishment Award for research in star formation. From two, 2015 to 2018, he was president of the division on interstellar matter and local universe and chair of the resolutions board for the International Astronomical Union, the IAU. And he was national representative of the uh, American Astronomical Society to the IAU. In the field of nanotechnology, Dr. Elmer Green has designed and modeled magnetic materials and devices, phase change material structures, and PSO electronic devices and circuits, obtaining 18 patents. He, uh, uh, he studies uh, whether patterns using uh, a Peter scale data and analytics platform. He was a member of the US National Science Foundation Math and Physical Science uh, Advisory Committee from 2012 to 2016, then became a fellow of the American Association for the Ad Advancement of Science in 2013, a recognition that is given to uh, distinguished scientists, engineers, or innovators who have been recognized for the extraordinary achievements. The conference Lessons from the Local Group was organized in 2014 at the Seychelles on the occasion of David, uh, David Block's uh, 16th uh, birthday and, uh, and the number given in base two, uh, birthday of Bruce Elmer Green. That's uh, quite amazing, I, I, I found it out. In, in 2020, he became fellow at the American Astronomical Society, uh, a recognition that honors individuals who have best enabled the uh, uh, American Astronomical Society to achieve its mission of enhancing and sharing humanity's scientific understanding of the universe. So these fellows are honored for extraordinary achievement and service. And uh, in fact, Margaret Barbage was named uh, inaugural fellow. His main interests in astrophysics include star formation, interstellar matter and galactic structure. Through a combination of observations, analysis, and computer modeling, he has proposed and developed models for triggered and spontaneous star formation processes in normal galaxy disks. His work on hierarchical structure in turbulent gas has applications to long-standing problems on the mass distributions and spatial arrangements of interstellar clouds and the stars they form. Using computer model simulations, he proved the existence of standing waves in spiral galaxies. He's a worldwide reference in these fields, uh, with about 400 refereed papers, more than 160 as third author, and about 27,000 citations. We have today, as I said at the beginning, the honor of having uh, uh, Bruce Elmer Green talking about infrared cores as traces of the earliest stages of submission in these spiral lamps of nearby galaxies. Thank you very much, Bruce, and the floor is, is ours, is yours. Thank you, Isabel.
Let me uh, first get this ready, a little trick I learned to get my laser on there. Um, so it's quite a pleasure to be here. Granada is one of my all time favorite cities. You'll recognize that little street post. Um, and of course, I hope to visit you in person sometime in the future when uh, COVID has uh, truly ended. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a long time interest I've had in I'm trying to get this thing minimized. There we go. In um, large scale properties of star formation, this has to do with um, where and how star formation begins on a galactic scale. And you, you know this problem, it's been around for a long time. The problem of star formation tracing spiral arms, strung out like pearls along the arms as, as Bada said originally. And the question is why is this? Um, we know that this, the spirals of course are, are density waves. Everything is compressed there. The gas is compressed also. And in most cases, the um, extra star formation there is just because there's extra gas. The change of efficiency is hard to measure. In some cases, um, there does appear to be a slight increase in the efficiency, that is rate per unit gas. Other cases, you can't really see that. But in any case, we can't really see what's happening. Uh, Roberts would have said in 1969 that there's a shock there and we can see those dust lanes but we don't see much happening in the dust lanes. Maybe it's just opaque. And then we see downstream from the dust lanes. Now this would be in this case, moving counterclockwise. We see all these OB associations and H2 regions. So we think there's a time sequence, but we don't see that really. So what's really happening? Well, um, this study began with communications with Yuri Evermoff, a good friend of Emilio's also. Yuri passed away a couple of years ago, was in Moscow. And he had, he had a particularly interesting galaxy, NGC 6946, which is not this galaxy, but he would always talk to me about 6946 and we couldn't quite make any headway on doing another paper on it. But he would show me these images from the Spitzer Iraq archives. And, and, and I show you a different galaxy here, M100, which illustrates the whole point of this talk very well. And after seeing these images, I recognized something here that was more intriguing to me than what Yuri was after. He was after the holes in the shells. And what I saw here is all the little dots. If you look at this carefully, this is the eight micron image. You see the spiral arms, of course, the eight microns are showing you pH emission. It's where all the gas and therefore dust is. And you see that you do see shells and so on. But you see all these little dots along the spiral arms. And I thought, you know, maybe this is the key to understand what's happening. So um, Debbie used her magic with uh, imagery and we subtracted the 24 micron Spitzer image from the eight micron image and making sort of an unsharp mask. 24 micron has a larger uh, angular resolution by a factor of about three. And so in this way, it could get rid of the average radial profile and also some features uh, associated with the spiral arms. And now you can see the dots very well. And at the positions of all these little dots, I'm, I'm referring to these little things here, sort of strung out in every little filament, every little arc, feather, spiral arm, are these eight micron dots. And the, they really don't have, in most cases, optical counterparts. Like here's a little streak. You see these nicely um, regularly spaced dots. And over here, well, maybe you see one of them, but then you can't see something here. It's obscured. And maybe the, you know, there's one supposed to be right here. That one's supposed to be right here, but you don't see it because of dust and so on. And in every case where you could see clearly in the infrared, because it penetrates the dust, you're seeing um, pH emission around bright regions, which are probably star formation regions, as I'll, I'll sh show you in a minute. Um, you could see this regularity, but you don't see it optically. So we have never seen what spiral arms or all of these filaments are doing. We've never seen the sites of star formation in these galaxies, except for a few cases like right here, that's that one, and here where they're poking out from the dust, but mostly it's totally obscured. 
So we looked at some spiral features just to measure properties to find these 27 filaments and in the clumps, which are the colored regions in the filaments and all the black regions are just other clumps and measured their separation. So their separation tends to be about 410 parsecs in this case. And here's the distribution of the relative separation. So when the relative separation is zero, that means they're equally spaced. If you have three in a row, look at the spacing between the first two and the second two, subtract that different that spacing. And if that's zero, they're equally spaced. So by and large, they're equally spaced. And sometimes there's a gap, which is the second peak. And third, we looked at the ratio of the separation to the diameter, and it's always around three. Well, these are characteristics of an instability in a filament, which has been studied a lot. Filaments close to the critical line density. Okay, so that's something you would have guessed. You see these uh, filaments of gas and uh, traced by dust. They have the, the equally spaced condensations along them. Gravity will do that. So that's kind of the first conclusion. Gravity is driving the initiation of star formation in spiral arms. But also the fact that there are so many often along the same spiral arm or along the same spur. So, and, and the regular all along that length suggests that these filaments or spurs are somewhat uniform in age. Otherwise, you, an older part would have a, one of these condensations in it, and a younger part would just be building up now, and it would be um, blank. And this would uh, vary arbitrarily if, if the shocks were, were building up uh, continuously at, at, with different starting times at different positions, and then you get the condensation and it would break apart and flow downstream and another one would build up. If that were happening at different times all along the length, you wouldn't see simultaneous dots. So that's kind of interesting. It tells you something that, which we would have known theoretically that these spiral arms are growing instabilities. Theory suggests that as it is. So the general concept here is you have a spiral density wave or other flows such as um, downstream from the wave, you might get filaments or spurs, shock the interstellar medium on large scales, and those shocks are just the filaments we're seeing, which collapse by gravitational instabilities and make stars. Same process that you see locally, maybe at a tenth of a percent the size. This is just a local little uh, Bach globule or lens filament. Now, uh, at high redshift, galaxies look a bit different. They don't have strong stellar spiral arms. Many don't have stellar spirals at all. They're just blobby like this, understood by. Uh, as a result of gravitational instabilities there, where you have a very gas rich disk, thick, highly turbulent. And these instabilities do happen wherever they happen, here and there in big globs. But in mo the modern universe, the galaxy accretion rates of gas are much lower. The gas as a result of that and also feedback being lower is less turbulent, it's thinner. It's now had a long history of this relatively slow star formation. So it's built up a cool stellar disk with a low gas fraction. There are still gravitational instabilities in the stars, but they don't cause globs, they cause spiral arms. And they're growing arms because it's an instability until the arms get nonlinear and they break apart. And also the gas has instabilities that are independently because these are two very different scales. The stars are forced to operate on the scale are given by the balance between the epicyclic length and gravity, whereas the gas operates on a scale given by the gravity a balance between pressure and gravity. And those are uh, very different scales. For the gas, it's much less. So if the gas is shocked in a spiral density wave and it's a thin little stream, that's the scale now for gravity in the gas. Whereas on a 10 or larger scale, was the instability that's already happening to give the spiral in the stars. So now we're studying these 15 galaxies in a separate paper. Um, and I wanna show you 628. You can see barely the little dots. These are all Spitzer archive images. This is old data. And now on the left is that eight micron, 24 micron unchart mask, and it's not very good. But on the right is the eight micron with a blurred eight micron version making its own unsharp mask. And you can see these dots very well. 
So here is 628 and to the same scale, it's dots. And if you concentrate on any one dot, you'll see it's in exactly the same place on both images. And you see that the unsharp mask brings out all these uh, filamentary structures containing the little eight micron cores. Here's another galaxy, 3184. And I'll just go through these. These are all made the same way. Just take the eight micron Spitzer image and do an unsharp mask. And because the eight microns is tracing primarily um, PAH emission and to a lesser extent, hot dust, there are glowing regions showing uh, very bright uh, concentrations of starlight, which are the young star forming regions. So here's, a, here's histograms of the um, apparent magnitudes. Um, apparent magnitude on the bottom going from um, 10 to 20, so from a bright to dim. And they, they all have about the same apparent magnitude range. Of course, they're all observed by Spitzer. Um, they all have about the same number to within a factor of a couple because these are standard Spitzer galaxies chosen for surveys like Sings, they all have about the same angular size. The two cases with strong spiral arms, NGC 1566 and 5194, that's M51. The red parts of the histogram show the cores in the spiral arms and they're a little brighter than elsewhere in the disk. So there's an interesting thing here. All of these galaxies have about the same number of clumps. They all look about the same and yet they have different distances. And why is that? It turns out to be a selection effect, which is kind of interesting. It, it's a detail having to do with hierarchical structure, but it really makes all these little dot images look about the same. Of course, the spiral arms look different, but they all have a similar character, even though the galaxies are at very different distances. And the selection here is that all galaxies have about the same angular size. So now if I plot R25 in kiloparsecs, that's the size of the galaxy out to 25th magnitude in kiloparsecs, that's on the x-axis, and one over the square root of density of the number of cores. So that's just the average separation between the cores. Well, there's a relationship. So bigger galaxies have the same number of cores as it turns out, but spaced more. So we're, we know we're missing a lot of the smaller cores, the closer spaced cores in the smaller galaxies. We're just not seeing them because of the selection for all galaxies having the same angular size. And you could see how that works out exactly if you start with a luminosity function of star forming regions, which is always about luminosity to the minus two. Is there a question? Okay. So the total number of cores, if you just integrate this luminosity function above some fixed minimum luminosity, that's say given by star formation, what's the smallest little star forming region you can get? It's just the ratio of the biggest to the smallest luminosity. That's what you get just by integrating this L to the minus two, you get an L to the minus one. And so you get the ratio of luminosities. And similarly, the total number you would see exceeding a minimum observed luminosity is the maximum size over that minimum observed luminosity. So that's the number. So if I have fixed star forming properties, that is a fixed minimum size or luminosity in a fixed um, true a density of regions around a galaxy. So now the number of these cores will scale with the galaxy area. Bigger areas will have more star forming regions. And therefore the maximum luminosity will get bigger for bigger galaxies. That's the so-called size of sample effect. That's if we continue this power law all the way up to the biggest scale, which tends to be pretty good. Um, there may be an exponential fall off that scales larger than a couple or three times 10 to the fifth solar masses of cluster, which would be um, much larger luminosities than anything you're looking at here. So that's, that's power law. So here, the number you expect goes um, with the uh, size of the galaxy squared and so luminosity maximum does. And for a constant limiting apparent magnitude, which is true for any survey, the minimum observed luminosity scales with distance squared too. So the ratio, the number observed, which is the ratio of this maximum size, which is a size of sample result, and the minimum observed size, which is a cutoff from observation, is constant. 
So we always get about the same number of dots. This shows the color-color uh, diagrams of all these dots for the 15 galaxies. They're always about the same. I've excluded some that are in the low part, which are bare stars. These in this cluster here of, of dots correspond to normal photospheres of fairly young stars with about 15 magnitudes of extinction, which is some 300 solar masses per square parsec. And the 5.8 to 8 micron cluster here, it tells you it's from PAH emission. Those are, that's essentially broadband line emission. So these are all highly extincted and very young star forming regions. Now I can take the total IRAC luminosity, I was showing you eight micron, but I can add the three others, convert that to bolometric for a young region, and then convert that to mass, again for a young region. And I can sum up all the masses of these little dots, not the diffuse pH stuff, but just the little dots. And I can plot that against the uh, star formation rate summed up from usual mechanisms, maybe H alpha, maybe it's H alpha plus 24 microns. And I get a linear relation, which is telling me that the star formation rate is scaling with the total mass of these cores. And the ratio of these two is a time scale. And if this were mapping all of the star forming regions in these galaxies, that time scale would be the lifetime of these little cores. And the time scale that we measure is between a tenth of a million year and about a million year. Those are these two dashed lines, which is pretty reasonable, you would guess, for the length of time a, a bright little an embedded cluster or young OB association is, is in one place, uh, illuminating PAH. So that tells me right away we are seeing essentially all, and of course, all meaning those I can see, that's the size of sample effect again. But, but in a L to the minus two distribution, the total mass increases with each logarithmic interval. So if I only see the, the top factor of 100 brightest ones in every case, I can easily get the additional bottom factor of 100 ones by just multiplying by two. So I'm within a factor of two of seeing all of the star formation in these galaxies. Um, just by summing these cores. And that other factor of two, that missing factor is all the fainter cores I don't see. So these cores are showing me the youngest phases of star formation. We also trace star formation with the H2 regions. Okay, it's the same star formation, but in the H2 regions, it's 10 million years later. And we get the same star formation rate because in that 10 million years, the star formation rate in the galaxy hasn't changed much. We're just seeing the youngest stages with these. So let's look at 628 again. There's the Spitzer image and there's the unsharp mask image. And here I'm going to blink between these two, optical and unsharp mask. And you could see that we've been fooled all these years looking just at the optical. And we can't really see those little dots which are showing us essentially all of the current star formation younger than a million years or so in this galaxy. And if you just concentrate on any one dot, you'll see it's there. But if you, if you look at a eight micron dots, often it's, you don't see anything optically. In the Milky Way, we see the same kinds of things. We've known in the Milky Way about the spiral arms for a while. This original paper in 1954 defined the Orion arm, the Perseus arm and Sagittarius arm. That's when they were first discovered and, and designated like that. Um, if we look at a modern map, this is H1 in the outer Milky Way. It's very clumpy. A clump size is about a kiloparsec. The smoothing length is this mass. This map is about a half a kiloparsec. Separation between some of these clumps is a kiloparsec, and you can see the spiral arms. And you get the idea that there's a similar knotted or clumpy structure even in the Milky Way. Here's the CO, which is primarily in the inner part of the Milky Way. Um, again, with uh, big concentrations. These are much bigger than individual molecular clouds. Let's just look at one region in the outer galaxy, the W345 complex, which is right here. Here it is. These are H2 regions now expanded. There's a, a current star formation going on in W3. There's a lot of bright rim type star formation around the edges of W4 and W5. So this is a continuing region of star formation. The whole age is depends on where you are. It's maybe 5 million years here, 
five to three here and less than a million years over in W3. Extends for about 150 parsecs. Let's look at another one. NCC 7538, it's this concentration of H1 right here. And it's a similarly aged, maybe 50 parsec scale, current region of star formation here, uh, shells and so on from um, a history of high pressures. If I put the two together in the sky, they're separated by maybe 500 parsecs. These are the major concentrations in the Perseus arm. And you're seeing the same properties. Each of these has a giant H1 cloud around it, uh, maybe 10 to the seventh solar masses. And these outer galaxy H1 clouds were observed in the 1950s and their masses were known then. I've looked at them also even in the inner galaxy. So these are just another manifestation of this beating phenomena with a, many hundred parsec scales and major concentrations of star formation in each one. Let's look at the inner part of the galaxy now. Well, both going from inner to outer. Here's the NGC 3603, one of the largest or most massive clusters in our galaxy. It corresponds to that H2, H, H1 region. Here it is, 3603. It's just a piece of this CO cloud. This is CO, this is H1 on the same scale. And surrounding it is a large H1 cloud, about 10 to the seventh solar masses. And next to it is another whole complex of CO clouds. All these GMCs are clustered together. Each one is about 10 to the fifth solar mass or 10 to the fourth in that range. And it's surrounded by a 10 to the seventh concentration of H1, another one here. So that's the hierarchical structure people talk about. Separation of these two is 0.6 kpc. For M100, it was 0.4 kpc. So we're seeing the same thing. Uh, this is another region. This is a little bit closer. These are negative velocities now. Eta Carina, a famous region, a cluster. Is this GMC? Uh, there's another one next to it. Again, 0.5 kpc is a separation. So what's happening? Uh, this is a, a schematic I drew a long time ago when I first started thinking about this. Uh, this is when I was looking at shock-induced star formation for OB associations and the natural extrapolation to galaxies would be to focus on the shocks there, which were dust lanes, and to hypothesize that the, uh, this oblique little shock, the dust lane would gravitationally collapse. Uh, it was very hard to prove then because this is a complicated region. There's shear and you don't have much time. It comes in, it comes out. So it's got to collapse in the midst of shear before the gas flows out. But it seemed to work out, so I made this little schematic. In the meantime, of course, now there are good simulations of this. Here's one, for example, Kim and Ostriker just letting a, in a shearing sheet, letting the instability grow. It makes filaments, which then break up into clumps. Dobb did this in the case of with gravity and again without gravity. They both make a clumpy structure because the the clouds, this is a, these are clouds, they con conglomerate, they come together. So there's always going to be a randomness to how they uh, come together and make bigger clouds. But when you have gravity, it does this in a regular way. When you don't have gravity, they're all over the place. Here's another case where uh, you have a growing spiral, you just turn on the simulation. And after a while, it immediately breaks up into these lumps, partly from a kelvin helmholtz instability here and partly from gravity. Going back to Bunnell and Dobbs, this shows the time scale. How long does it spend in the shock? This was always hard to, to guess from the analytical work, but we see it here very well from simulations and it's about 30 million years. Gas comes in, flows through and comes out again. It has to do everything while it's in the shock. So you've got 30 million years to play with. So now we have two numbers. We have the separation between the clumps and we have a time scale and we can get everything from that. Suppose they're filamentary instabilities. The separation is the fastest growing mode, which has this equation for its length. We observe that. So now we get a ratio of this mass per unit length over the density, that's here. We have a time scale, which just depends on density. It's less than some 30 million years, which gives a minimum density in the, in the shock front, which is about the same as, as Debbie measured for her thesis a long time ago, just from uh, radiative transfer in the dust of the shock front. It's not GMC density. The average density is modest. 
So I can combine these two and get a mass free unit length, which I can then multiply by the length and get a typical gas mass in one of these clumps. A couple times 10 to the fifth solar masses. So that's a big GMC, not unruly big. Around one of these would be H1 to add to the to mass. And that mass of six times 10 to the fifth compares pretty well with the equivalent stellar mass in a clump, which is 10 to the three. And I remind you what I showed you before, here was the sum core mass and star formation rate. The sum core mass is for all the cores, is several hundred, it's 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth. So divide the sum by that several hundred and I get around 10 to the three or a couple of times 10 to the three for each one, for that's in stars. So the star mass a couple times 10 to the three compared to the gas mass, which just comes from the instability, now agrees. The stars are a few percent of the gas. That's a normal efficiency. So both the separation and time scale, are all, all that I needed to get the unstable mass. And that agrees with the IRAC stellar mass, which I get from the IRAC luminosity. So now let's look on edge on galaxies. Of course, as I mentioned, today's disks are not thick in the, in the early universe. If you're looking at edge on galaxies, we've done that in a couple of papers. They're actually quite thick. They're uh, 500 parsecs, kiloparsecs thick, thick. You don't see a thin layer at all. Today you see thin and you know the remnants of that old thick disk are still here. It's the old thick disk today, which we can see in all these galaxies. If you look in uh, it with Spitzer uh, images, um, the band four in Iraq, you can see the thick disks. Uh, there are other ways to see it. Our own Milky Way has an old thick disk, which we could see as high velocity stars. Uh, typically, when you just look at an optical image of an edge on galaxy, you don't see the thick disk, you just see the thin disk. And certainly when you look at these Spitzer images, all you see is the thin disk. That's what we have for today. And here are the three galaxies in the Spitzer archive. And by the way, those 15 that I showed you before are plus M100, so that's 16. That's about all there is in the Spitzer archive. Um, from surveys, uh, just happens to be what's there, where there are um, decent resolution to give you the clumps. So the three edge on, let's look at those. Here's that famous one, 891, the one that everyone looks at for an edge on galaxy. It's really, really edge on. Here's the unsharp mask image, and you can see it's really, really straight. Of course, disks are stable. They want to be straight. If you perturb them with some interaction, they'll oscillate for a while, waves will move, and it'll eventually straighten on average and you'll end up with a little bit of a thickening of the disk, but the midplane will end up straight. I mean, you can see all the little dots, if you look carefully, those are the eight micron dots. And on the right, I put a little blue circle at each one just to cover them over. That's how we identify them. So we don't lose any. And here it is again uh, in two parts. The bottom part is here, so there's the tip of it and the bottom part, the top part is here, so there's the top tip. This is the optical image, you can see not too many dots, you can see some stars and here's the eight micron image, not the unsharp mask version, there is the total eight microns. And all these little red circles are the dots that we found. And if you look inside the red circles, you don't see much. Occasionally you'll see a little white dot, so that guy right here, right here uh, corresponds to an eight micron image, an eight micron dot, it would be uh, one of these in here. Some of these off the plane do, mostly they're obscured, which is not surprising because it's an edge on disk. So there's not only the extinction from the star forming region, there's also foreground extinction. Here's the other part, it gets a little thick uh, toward the other end, and, and but the uh, eight microns are still somewhat in the plane. And, and sometimes you see like this one right here has a little a brightness inside. Some of these do, or mostly they don't. NGC 3628. Um, this has a lot of uh, dispersed perpendicular to the plane of these dots, but it's an interacting galaxy here. It's got a lot of, of stellar haze from the outer disk getting perturbed, there's a companion that just passed it that's off the, off the screen here. Uh, so you can see the dust and stars have been scattered, but if you look 
here's a superimposed eight micron image again, not unsharp mask, but the raw image. It's still very, very much in a plane. It's very stable. And you wouldn't know that there's a stable flat disc inside the optical image, but there it is in the eight micron image. So you, you learn that most of this spread is from the outer part of the disc, which has gotten um, perturbed in the perpendicular direction to make a warp, which is wrapped around a bit. And finally, here's IC 5052. It's a smaller galaxy, um, not as many clumps. You can see, uh, well, there's still a good 100 clumps, I think 80 or so, I'll show you in a second, um, with two bright ones in the center. And here's 5052. It's got some optical ones, which even look um, the blue at, at the, um, is showing you young regions of star formation. Here it is at eight microns. And uh, here you could see them. The blue are the embedded or, or eight micron cores. Red are just foreground stars, which we can, we can tell the difference from the uh, short Iraq band colors. So let's look at the perpendicular distance from the midplane. Three galaxies, distance from the midplane, and here's the number. So the distance decreases as you get off the midplane. Obviously, they're confined to the midplane. You can get the scale height this way, here, here. And let's look at, and I'll, I'll show you the scale length in a second. Let's look at distance from the midplane versus radius. So it's just to get the scale height from this diagram, but now dividing those histograms into different radial bins. So here it is as a function of radius. 891, which is the most edge on case, the thickness increases a little bit with radius, maybe a factor of two. Not much, but there's an increase. And that's not surprising, perhaps. Um, I'll tell you that it really is surprising, but, but for a reason you may not be thinking about right now, which I'll get to in a second. But it is a slight increase. 5052 is a slight decrease. That's what you'd get if it's not quite edge on, because then the middle part, you're seeing the near and far edges of it off the midplane. And so the middle part, the central line of sight, gets you some extension above and below the plane because you're looking at the near and far parts, which are not exactly aligned with the, uh, the center if it's somewhat uh, tilted. Very tiny tilt will do that. 3628 is the um, interacting galaxy. And here, the, the height is much bigger. You see in 891, it's only 100 parsecs or so. Here, it's nearly 500 parsecs. But there, you've got all the flopping of the disk. But now on the right, I plot the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And you see all that disk flopping is confined to one half of the galaxy. And the other half shows a fairly normal scale height, a couple hundred parsecs, which uh, is pretty much constant with distance. Now to remind you, the thickness variation in the Milky Way is pretty well known. It's very hard to get for other galaxies. If you see them face on, you don't really know their thickness. And if you see them edge on, there's too much extinction to know what's happening in the midplane. So the, the run of thickness with galactocentric radius is really unknown. And because of that, there's a lot of confusion about the, the most important diagnostic that's ever been talked about for star formation, which is the Kennecott-Schmidt relation. But I think we're starting to crack that nut. And so I begin with this di um, distribution for the Milky Way, just to tell you what you probably know, that the scale height of molecular gas, which is really the star formation scale, it is about constant. And then it has a flare starting at the solar radius. So the inner part of the disk is pretty constant. Why that should be is quite a mystery, because there's an exponential disk in here. So the, the perpendicular forcing, which just depends on the surface density of gas and stars, decreases exponentially here. So you'd think the disk would get thicker exponentially if the, if the velocity version was constant, but it's not. The thickness is staying constant. That's why this is such a, a perplexing topic and why I showed you that what you thought might have been simple for 891 and having a slowly rising thickness is not so simple. Well, here we have the Milky Way, and this is what you can get if the thickness varies much more slowly than the surface density. 
So the thickness can increase with radius a little bit, but if it's if it increases much more slowly than the exponential, then the Kennecott-Schmidt relation follows trivially, because you have an exponential disk of gas and stars. Q, the tumor constant, is regulated by density waves and instability to be about constant. So that's what gives you the velocities version. I think it's not feedback. I think feedback is a very local scale. Feedback breaks apart GMCs. And the study I just did with Deidre and some others, we looked at local velocity dispersion of H1 in some 30 dwarf galaxies and compared it to the star forming regions. There's almost no excess local velocity dispersion around star forming regions uh, in the H1. It's even more confined than that couple hundred parsec that you'd see for H1. So I think feedback is confined. I think the velocity dispersion that's on a large scale, which gives you the overall thickness of the disk, and a lot of the properties of gravity on a large scale comes just from the regulation by spiral instabilities of Q. So there's your velocity dispersion. Just depends on the surface density of gas and the epicyclic frequency. And now we get the scale height just from the, those two. And so therefore we get the density and the star formation rate is just the amount of gas you have per unit area times the uh, rate, which is the square root of density. And so here is that star formation rate as these two red lines, slope of 1.5. And, and this is what you get by assuming some ro standard rotation curve arising to flat. It's always about the same. And look at this blue line, which comes from this theory. Slope is about one and a half. One does not work. One is true only if you're just looking at molecules. And there you have a selection effect that you're only looking at molecules. So naturally, you always have about the same density. It's the threshold to excite the molecule. So rho is constant, so the star formation rate per unit area, just the molecular gas per unit area. Linear relation, that's not the pure physics of star formation, which contains gravity, which contains a density dependent time scale, which is the true Kennecott relation for total gas. And it just comes, I think, from having the thickness being much more constant than the surface density. So let's look at these edge on this a little more carefully, looking for shingles or corrugation, something that we see in the Milky Way, we see lots of perpendicular structures. Maybe you can imagine shells here, things getting tossed up and down. You see some so-called shingles, which have been um, well studied in the Milky Way. And I know um, Emilio likes this picture. He's been looking at these perpendicular uh, features in the Milky Way for a long, long time. That's 891, here's 3628. Um, inter this is the one that's interacting, and I showed you that uh, this half of the disk has got a very, th very much thickening, even of the star formation. GMCs are shot up to a kiloparsec or so. If the half, half thickness is about 500 parsec, even for the gas. The other side, the quiet side, is thinner, a couple hundred parsecs. And these things are consistent with being spiral arms, actually, with uh, 400 parsec spacing between them if you deproject them, and a little bit of an of an inclination, you know, like 89 and a half degree inclination, not exactly 90 degrees. And here's the uh, bright nuclear disk. And 5052, uh, maybe some structures, maybe this is random, maybe your eye is just being led to see some things, but, um, but there is a, some perpendicular structure and that's what gives the scale height, of course. It's not just everywhere an exponential fall off of the same kind of stuff. There's real structure with uh, the perpendicular direction. That's not understood. So to summarize the results for edge on, and then I'll give you the final summary, which is everything. Um, so I'm almost done here. Hundreds of eight micron cores have been seen in these three edge on galaxies. Here are the number of cores, a couple hundred. Uh, 60 for the smallest one. The average extinction we, for the star forming region we can take from the face on galaxies, assume it's the same for the edge on. So we get the foreground extinction, some 11 magnitudes, which is sensible, giving an average density of ISM of about one per cubic centimeter. The average young stellar mass in these regions, which we see around 10 to the fourth, about the same as what we got before, which was around 10 to the third, but here, um, you're looking through more extinctions, so you don't see as many, you see the brighter ones. The ratio of the core total mass to the star formation rate 
is about the same, a million years or so. So this is a lifetime. Again, we're seeing the earliest stages. It's a little bigger number than before because we're only seeing the brightest ones. The half thicknesses are somewhat sensible, like 891 is similar to the Milky Way, 100 parsecs or so, similar for 50, 52. For 3628, it's much larger, but it's just had an interaction. So half of the disk is highly flared. Um, even, even the inner thick part is that, the outer part is even more flared. There are loops suggesting blowout, and most of these cores have no optical tracers and were never seen before. So in conclusion, most star formation in today's disk galaxies seems to occur by this process of collapse in filaments. And that's on scales ranging over three to four orders of magnitude. All I've done here is showing you what we've known for a long time on small scales, but it also occurs on large scales. Spiral arms and spurs in those arms and even big shells trigger star formation by collecting the gas into shock fronts where it indeed has time to collapse by self-gravity. This is a property of today's cool stellar dominated disks in which the main influence of gravity is to drive stellar spiral arms which grow and then break apart. The gas just follows shocking into these kiloparsec sized dust lanes. And because these arms are growing and the time scale is you know, a couple hundred million years, it's quite conceivable that many long spiral arm pieces and dust lanes are all about the same length all along those arms, which gives a regularity to the dots. The perpendicular thicknesses of the galaxies rise slowly with radius, much more slowly than the inverse surface density. And I think that can explain the Kennecott-Schmidt relation in a trivial way. Um, and, oh, I should get back. Yeah, and that's, that's the end. Good, so thank you. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much. I'll leave this on. Bruce, thank you very much. And uh, now the talk is uh, open for questions. Please uh, raise your hand to do so, and I will let you open your micro. I think Emilio wants to ask something. Okay, go on, Emilio. Yeah, hello, everybody. Okay, Good to see you. thank you, Bruce, for this nice talk. And really has been very interesting to me because uh, there is some points I don't understand very well. So, uh, in particular, my question is, uh, you are considering here gravity as the only driving force able to produce this kind of uh, figures and scale you are using in your observation. But what happened with the magnetic field? Is something that uh, could change the scale sometimes for this kind of, for the formation of this course? Yeah, very good question. Of course, there is a field, it, it's comparable in pressure. Um, it's comparable in pressure to uh, thermal some places larger, and the variation between thermal and turbulent is a factor of three to 10. So in many cases, it's comparable to the turbulent pressure. And there would be a field in these shock fronts compressed. Um, that would not, if, if it's compressed laterally, um, that would not affect the condensation along the length because it would just move along the field. But it would um, vary the separation a bit. They'd be a bit longer if there's a, a field as well. So, um, What's involved in including or not including that field is on order of factors of two. And I have not included it here because it's not quite sure what orientation the field has. Um, mm -hmm. For example, if it's, it should be a little oblique, in fact, a little oblique in those spiral arms. So um, there's still be some motion, but it's, it's not easy to get the separation. So I've done a first cut. Also, when we look at polarization, we tend to see the field strength a little stronger. Uh, I think it's between the arms because they're more combed out there and the polarization is less mixed in a beam. So the field structure is a bit uh, chaotic where star formation has lots of this yeah. local feedback. It's a little smoother when um, star formation has died down. Um, so the field will, vary my story in the factor of two range. 
But once you have a little condensation like this, the field is not going to affect it much. Once, once gravity uh, starts pulling things along the field, it's going to dominate. And, and this is the key. In observations of magnetic fields and GMCs, most GMCs are just beyond critical mass, mm -hmm. meaning that they're free to pretty much collapse and bring in the field with them. That's unlike the situation we were imagining 30 or 40 years ago when the field would, would hold up gas and you'd have to have wait for magnetic diffusion and be very long time scales. It does not seem to be true. <clears throat> the, the fields are very close to critical and all you have to do is be a little greater than critical and then, then the collapse will proceed. And in many cases, it is like that. So the field is much less of an influence on the GMC scale than we used to think. And so star formation is much faster than we used to think on that scale. Yeah. Um, but on a galactic scale, it still has an influence that are factors of two. Yeah. May I ask a second question, Rene? Rene? Yes, sorry. I, I was talking. I may, may I ask a second question? Okay. Yeah, yes, go okay. ahead. Well, uh, Bruce, the, the, my other question is the, uh, you estimate that the uh, typical mass for this core is 10 to the four solar masses. But uh, it's very difficult to find young stellar uh, cluster with this high mass. Uh, what is happening there? Yeah, uh, good point. So for the 15 face-ons plus M100, it's around 10 to the three or so. So really there's a distribution. There's a, uh, uh, it's not you know all one mass, but that was just the average. Uh, from the from the total mass divided by the number, but there's a distribution, and the average is around ten to the three, or a couple times that. The edge on ones is a little uh, larger because there, I think, you don't see the ten to the three so easily because of four, uh, ten or eleven magnitudes of foreground extinction. So the number you're looking for is more like ten to the three, and yes, there are a bunch of those. And by the time in our galaxy you get to the ten to the four or larger, there aren't so many, and I I would agree with that here too. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Emilio. Then we have another question by Isabel. Go on. Thank you very much, Professor. It's been a, a great, great talk. I have loved it. I have one, in, in fact, it's two questions with just in one. Uh, do, do you think there is something different to expect when you consider strongly interacting or emerging galaxies or when you go to a younger universe? Uh, do, what what, what yeah. do you think about that? Yeah, good question. If you just have grazing incidents, then that can cause strong tidal features and strong shocking. And we've looked at some of those galaxies where you get, sometimes you get a, we actually see a compression front moving in, we call it an ocular structure. There, there's lots of star formation, also equally spaced, which is really how we first noticed this, that would be about 10 years ago um, in a certain interacting galaxy. Um, if, and that structure will go in, you can get it forming a bar, in fact. Also, you know, in 51 types, you can get strong spiral arms. In that case, where you just have a spiral arm triggering or, or initiation mechanism, it's pretty much the story I told you today. If you have an interaction that actually touches where they, like the antenna, where you've got the two ISMs hitting each other, you can get very strong shocks in the middle. And that's seen in the overlap region of the antenna. And you can get very massive clouds there in a quite irregular pattern, generating high speed turbulence and lots of um, high compressions. So that would be a different story you would expect. And I haven't looked lots of little clumps all over the place there. In the early universe, uh, you have a higher gas fraction in general, because it's just younger, and there's a higher accretion rate. And that high accretion gives you energy, but also higher star formation to keep up with that accretion and higher feedback to keep up with that star formation. For all those reasons, you get more turbulence in the thicker disk. And there again, uh, you don't have the regularity of an undissipating stellar component. Everything is dissipating. So you get clumps everywhere. And there again, the morphology is different and the clumps still genes length, but bigger because the turbulence is bigger. The scale is always about the thickness because that's how the genes length works out. So there you get a few big things. Today we get lots of little things because the disk is thinner. Same process, I think. Okay, so um, uh, so it, the expectation for the Kenny uh, Smith's law would be the same as well, or do you expect some difference? 
I expect it, 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 it's about the same. Yes, if you look at total gas, that's hard to do at high distance, except now it's almost totally molecular in some cases. And there you, you do see, but Takani and others do see this 1.5 again in the total gas. Looking at denser tracers, you get back to one because you're again selecting a certain subset. Um, and, and I expect, um, yes, I've, I've looked at this and you can explain it entirely in these terms uh, with a little bit of a thicker disk. But again, the, what you, is required for the simple explanation is to have the thickness be pretty much a more uh, constant than the exponential fall off. We do know at high redshift, they're exponential disks. And in the edge on cases we've seen, it's about constant thickness. And we know in the old disks of today, it's about constant thickness. So for some reason, feedback, and Bono and I showed this in a simulation, um, if you have the thickness generated by interactions, then the thin little outer disk flops more and you'd get a flaring of the thickness. If the feedback, if, if the thickness is by feedback, then where the disk is lighter, you get less feedback because there's not as much star formation there. And it all works out miraculously to give about a constant thickness. So if feedback and internal processes are internal are making the thick disk, like internal stirring, you expect a more or less constant thickness. If external processes are stirring, then you expect a flaring. And since it's pretty much constant at high redshift and in local galaxies, uh, we think again, it's a a local internal stirring. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel. More questions? Bruce, don't be shy. Okay, seeing none, uh, let's thank finish you. this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, for this wonderful talk. Great, Great and, to visit you. Uh, Please. <laughs> yeah. And come here to Granada to, for the next one. Yeah. Certainly, we'll want to do that. Okay, Bru, thank you very much. Take care. For Take visiting lunch. us virtually, but <laughs> visiting <Yeah>. us. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we keep the contact. Yep. Good. Bye. Okay.